Welcome to Closer to Truth. This is a special video on the upcoming world-renowned How the Light Gets In Festival, the world's largest music and philosophy festival organized by the Institute of Art and Ideas, IAI. I'm speaking with IAI founder and philosopher Hillary Lawson. Closer to Truth viewers may recall our previous discussion about Hillary's innovative, probative system of non-realistic metaphysics called closure the name of his important book. If you haven't watched the video, please check it out. Hillary created IAI to bring philosophy and intellectual ideas into public discourse, which brings us to this year's exciting event. Hillary, welcome. It's good to see you again. Uh, please describe the How the Life Gets In Festival. Very good to see you again, uh, Robert, and thank you for uh, inviting me. Yeah, well, um, as you've described, it's uh, the How the Light Gets In is a philosophy festival. We try and address the big issues uh, facing us, and we're always trying to be at the edge of thought, you know, trying to uh, ask the questions which are haven't yet been framed, as it were, that we're moving towards and trying to explore what is the future for thought. Uh, what are some of the main themes, particularly this year? So every year we have a theme around which we frame the key debates in the festival. We have 300 events, so uh, uh, we don't uh, stick religiously to that all the way through. But uh, our primary theme this year is dangers, desires and destiny. And in each case of our main events, we're looking at a danger that we face and thinking, what is it that we really want to achieve in dealing with this uh, danger, and what is likely to be the outcome? So dangers, desires, and destiny. Decubed, as, as we might say. Um, I, I'm sure dangers is not something you have to look uh, around to, to, to find very much of, unfortunately, in today's okay. world. So. Uh, who are some of the headline speakers? Well, we've got a whole range of speakers in the usual way, more than, more than 300 uh, uh, people taking part. But in terms of key key figures, there's uh, uh, Zizek and Roger Penrose, and we've got Peter Singer. Um, there's also General Petraeus, a whole load of people, basically the you know many of the leading figures in the world uh, on whatever the topic happens to be. Uh, let's give some specifics. When is it? Where is it? How can uh, viewers uh, uh, find out more information and, and perhaps attend? It's what we think of as the last bank holiday in May. Uh, it covers four days, so it starts on a Friday, runs through the weekend until the till the following uh, Monday. And uh, it's in an absolutely glorious location by uh, what's known as the River Wye. Uh, thought to be the most beautiful uh, river in the UK. So mm. it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful space and uh, it, everybody always has a fantastic time. And what, one of the things about the festival is we don't have a sort of VIP area. We encourage all of our celebrities to mingle with the crowd. So you're just as likely to have your most entertaining philosophical conversation in the queue when standing next to um, whoever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as you are to uh, have it uh, at an event. So it's a, it's a really amazing uh, uh, event, really. And there's also music, comedy, some entertainment to uh, energize yeah, exactly. the philosophy. Right? You, you can party into the night if, uh, if you <laughs> brought your dancing shoes with you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, knowing closer to truth and the co topics we cover, uh, what do you think would be the most interesting topics for closer to truth uh, viewers and fans? Well, I don't know, the, 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 the obvious more scientific topics that we've got, a couple are really uh, intriguing. You know, one, one of them is journey to other dimensions with um, mm. Roger Penrose and uh, Avshalom Elitzir and Marika Taylor. And it's, that is really about the idea that other dimensions have become a sort of standard part of contemporary physics. Uh, but we are asking, is this a mistake? is the very notion of this reference to other dimensions for which, of course, we can have no evidence in principle, um, actually holding physics back rather than uh, solving uh, questions. So I think uh, th th that debate, journeying to other dimensions, will, will be great. We've also got one on uh, called Faster Than Light, uh, which is questioning whether the absolute of the speed of light, which, again, we, we all take for granted, key part of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity and so forth, central part of contemporary physics. We're saying, 
is it possible that that absolute is again um, a, a problem? It's somehow undermining our ability to be able to move forward with physics. So I think both of those are very much closer to truth type topics, but there are plenty of others not in a in in just a sort of science area, um, which are which are more heartland uh, uh, philosophy, uh, which uh, I'm sure would also be of interest. Yeah, is it fair to ask you what's your favorite part? It's like asking which which of your children you like best. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, as you say, we you know, three hundred events. It's pr pretty invidious choosing one. I guess uh, uh, um, the the one that we've got with um, Zizek and Peter Singer. They've never been. They've never debated together uh, previously. Mm -hmm. They they've both been called the most dangerous philosopher on earth. Um, okay. I, I think I, I think that's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, it's about the question of the the title of the event is humanity and the gods of nature. And it's about whether we've framed morality in the context of human goals and human desires. And is that uh, problematic? And could we have framed morality so that it wasn't dependent on that human perspective? Uh, yeah, so two terrific, I, terrific guys, yeah. Yeah. And so I think I think that's uh, that, that, that's going to, that's definitely going to be one uh, to be in. If if it's possible to get a seat, you have to get there early. I think. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, I encourage everyone to find out more information uh, about uh, about the how the light gets in festival. It should be terrific. So, so Hillary, uh, we've asked closer to truth viewers to send in some questions, and and this is unfortunately not going to be a, a fun philosophical uh, uh, exploration <laughs> with you and I. We're just going to kind of touch and tease some some of these questions. But um, of the all the questions that have come in, actually more than half. Uh, dealt with AI, artificial intelligence. So this is, you know, in the in the hot public mind now. And so different ways of asking the same question. Let me just throw some out, and uh, let's just see, you know, if if you and I can can fight about it, or on, or uh, if we agree, which uh, probably is, is is a rare occurrence among among people <laughs> to think about these things. So the first one, the big one, is will AI become conscious? And if so, what is the key to AI consciousness? So give me a quick answer and I'll give you mine. No. And the reason? Well, I think the, the very talk of AI is really marketing hype. Uh, when when people like Elon Musk uh, say, oh, it, you know, it, AI is fantastically dangerous, it's going to take over. Um, uh, I think he's really promoting his next move of uh, of. Uh, uh, proposing a, a new form of um, of chat GBT or whatever he he chooses to call it when it comes out, yeah. and and of course the best way of promoting that and there are huge financial interests in doing it is to make out that it's doing more than it is. I mean AI is basically uh, dumb uh, 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 programming. Uh, well, not dumb programming. It's it's it's, it's a dumb machine. And it is uh, copying an average of a certain section of human response to whatever it is. That is nothing to do with thought. Uh, no machine has ever thought anything. It's not about to think anything. And we don't have the first idea how it would do such a thing. So well, that, I think that is AI, AI is Im immensely, impor immensely important. It's going to have all sorts of implication, but it's a tool for us to use. It's not something that is somehow going to become conscious. Well, the, the so-called dangers of AI have really two categories. One is how it'll affect us, what you're just saying, which in, is in terms of changing jobs. I just had a big uh, paper I wrote and it was submitted rather than to a, a professional copy editor to an AI system. And it it, it was pretty good. It wasn't at the standard, it still needed work. Uh, but AI will put people out of work. So that's one category. The other category is, will there be some deep philosophical insights about the nature of reality? And it's really been uh, a hype. Uh, remind you that all of the uh, conventional wisdom that AI, AI will become conscious, only a question of when, uh, is founded on a philosophical assumption of materialism, uh, uh, physicalism, and then the categories of what's called functionalism, which means that it doesn't matter what in, what uh, uh, substrate you have functions in, it would, it would be the same if it's biology or silicon or, or DNA. It doesn't matter anything. 
would be the same. And also computationalism, which is that the mind works works uh, like a computer in a general sense. So each of those aspects are fundamental um, assumptions that that you need to assume before you even discuss whether AI is conscious. And as we both know, each of those have been challenged. I think it's just important with, with AI, as I say, to realize there are lots of people with vast vested interests here. And as I say, the very vocabulary, artificial intelligence, is a lie. It's not intelligent. That's not what's going on. But it sounds good, doesn't it? It's a good way of selling a product. Now, that product is very important. Uh, I think, of, of course, we'll be able to use it in all sorts of ways. But it's not intelligent in the sense that we imagine uh, what that we mean by intelligent. So... And, and, and the argument is, uh, which you know, I would tend to agree with you, which I, which, which uh, disappoints me. By the way, I don't like. <laughs> yes. I, like to, I like to fight with you, but uh, <laughs> on this, I think we do agree. Um, yep. But the the concept is that at some point, the uh, qua the uh, quantitative addition of uh, all the inner activities that are going on between the between the input of the data and then the output and all the <clears throat> manipulation will <clears throat> hit a um uh, a threshold and that will become like a step function increase uh, to achieve what's called a, a general artificial intelligence, which is another term for human-like intelligence. And then the question is if you have that, uh, would consciousness uh, be a uh, an automatic part of that, which some people believe? Uh, I believe that's not true. That that would be two separate questions. You're you're even saying that art artificial general intelligence is not going to happen. Well, I think it depends on everything is about the definition of our terms here. I agree with all of the things you said there, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so, so uh, as you say, I I, I think. Um, there will be, you know, continuing uh, extensions of our ability to be able to uh, get uh, computers uh, to reflect uh, certain sorts of activities, but that's nothing to do with them uh, somehow thinking. Uh, and uh, and we hold the plug. And the only danger, uh, the only the only danger from our point of view, is uh, if somehow we allowed. Uh, the machinery of uh, uh, computers to become so embedded in our culture that we are not really able to unplug it if we thought that it, it is behaving in a way that we are uncomfortable with. But it's not deciding anything. It's not somehow moving against humans. It's not thinking anything. Um, and in fact, all of the recent stuff about AI, as you know only too well, is about language models. Uh, if you put a computer in the real world and ask it to find itself a way around, it's it's not terribly good at doing that. And certainly uh, there's no indication that it's going to be able to um, have something that we would regard as a thought. So yeah, so the various questions that we get in is AI enhanced by quantum computing really mixes up two separate issues because these are two magic words that are in the public domain. and quantum computing, if you can get an algorithm that can do AI, which is uncertain, uh, it, it, you, you would just accelerate, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't change it, it, its quality. So questions about whether AI would become our rulers or block human inputs um, is, uh, it, it are, are really questions that uh, are spiked by this, uh, this uh, craze that people are, 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 are undergoing. Uh, let, let's uh, let's transition to some non-AI questions. And the first, uh, it really is my favorite, and it directly uh, impacts the uh, the theme of uh, this year's How the Light Gets In Festival, uh, which is um, what is the most dangerous desire of humankind? So here's a question that was so prescient to understand that it got two of your of your uh, three themes in one question. Yes, well, there are there are many human desires that are I, dangerous. Only one. Just, it says the most. If, if, I'm, if I'm going to go for one, I'll go for a controversial one. I think it's the desire to uh, know everything. Mm. So, and the reason I suggest this is because I think it's an illusion. I think the idea of knowledge is an illusion. We have ways of holding the world, as you know, as a smart my account of things. 
and we should be aware of both their limitations and the extent there are always other ways of holding the world and the belief that we can arrive and somehow impose our version of knowledge on the rest of the world is i think a source of conflict uh, and uh, undermining of uh, culture more generally so controversially say the desire for knowledge Right. And, and I would once again uh, recommend uh, viewers to watch uh, uh, our discussion with Hillary about closure, which uh, deals with some of these topics in, in great depth. So there's, there's there's a lot of great substance be, uh, behind what he said. I would I would take a, a, a more um, geopolitical approach. And, and I'd say the greatest danger is nationalism uh, that I've seen uh, just develop more and more patriotism, we, we say is good. Uh, and and everybody should be patriotic, but there's a there's a very blurry, fuzzy line between uh, patriotism and nationalism, and we see a great um, increase uh, in many areas. A lot of the problems in the world uh, can be can be attributed to that, and I, I attribute nationalism to a misguided um, uh, uh, adaptation of what was critical in our early days as hunter gatherers in the evolutionary process, where group cohesion was e extremely important for survival. And today that group cohesion, which enabled evolution, uh, of human beings has metastasized and, and it's approached, whether it's your ethnicity, whether it's your nation, uh, that has become, uh, a very vicious and, 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 leadership and, 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 and political leadership can, has been known to exploit that. So that that gives me the greatest concern. Yeah. And interestingly, I mean, you could reframe that as tribalism, couldn't you? So that's not yeah. only a nation state, it's just the idea that you're all part of you're on one side. And the danger of being on one side is you're against people who aren't on your side. And um, uh, and that's certainly certainly very prevalent. And as you say, it's gone goes right back. There's an advantage being alongside other people. There are good reasons why it's a beneficial thing, but it's also always a threat. So every tribe is both um, a, a good and bad thing at the same time. And you just want to try and avoid the worst bits of the bad bits. Yeah, and uh, that that's a that's a challenge for for, for humankind. Uh, the it only. Is. The only tribes that uh, that have conflict are the ones next to each other. The tribes mm. across the world, they they don't. So uh, it, there's, there's obviously a very a very uh, contiguous uh, aspect to it. So let's just do a couple of uh, really wild, random things. Uh, this is a closer to truth favorite. Did everything that exists in the universe today exist at the moment of the initial singularity? We're, we're both going to give short answers. <laughs> Gosh, I'm not quite sure how to begin a response to that. First of all, I don't think there are things that exist as such in quite that <laughs> straightforward way. Um, I certainly uh, don't think there's a sort of given set of things that there were at the outset and that we might find now. We can build a model of the universe which reflects that idea and we can try and get that model to work. It's actually in all sorts of pieces, in my view. But um, I don't think that out there in in the world, as it were, we would find individual nuggets of things. The things come from the vocabulary we use to describe whatever is out there. Um, and those things are, in a sense, always changing. The ways in which we describe uh, the world are always changing. So uh, I love your deconstruction of the question. So uh, which is very <laughs> important. <laughs> uh, but, you know, my, my approach would be that, of course, at the very beginning was all a, almost a homogenous plasma. Uh, but in in the singularity, whatever it was, there was potential, and the potential can't be everything. So like George Ellis ca calls it a, a, a phase space. Uh, uh, Stuart Kaufman says, uh, raise a potentia. There are um, potential possibilities in, in what was uh, there that we almost, it's impossible to, dis to, to discern why. So the last question is uh, kind of a practical one, is uh, social media more bad than good in, in that it's numbing our uh, higher human desires in life and uh, forcing us into really the tribalism that you discussed. Yeah, I'm definitely on the, it, it does more harm than good. 
I think it's a lot of it, I think is pernicious. And I think the only way we can change that is to end anonymity. Well, another way we can change it is to attend the How the Light Gets In Festival and everybody engage together. So, Hillary, we could go on forever. Uh, this is just a wonderful conversation. It's always fun speaking. We'll definitely do more. But once again, uh, give our viewers uh, a, a quick way to get more information about the How the Light Gets In Festival. Well, unfortunately, we all know the answer to that. You just type in how the light gets into Google and you'll find all about it. So that's that's the way to find out about it. But it's uh, it's at the end of May, uh, last bank holiday in May, and uh, it's in it's in Britain and fantastic location. World's leading speakers. You'll never forget it if you come. Great. Well, thanks, Hillary. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. And uh... Everyone should uh, type those words into into your search engine. How the light gets in festival. It's all one word, so you don't put any uh, you don't put any gaps in. So when you type it in, just type it in with how the light gets in without any any gaps between the words. <laughs> okay, thanks again. Thank you, Robert. Very good to talk to you as always. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.